My uh, CFM capstone students are sick of this photo. Uh, but I do like to say that I've spent almost all my life in this little patch of post-Christendom that we call Sydney, Australia. I was raised by that beach there in the front. I went to school at the top of the hill. And apart from my wandering years as a musician, I spent all of my ministry life in this photo. I was an evangelist for the 65 churches uh, within the North Shore of Sydney. Uh, I eventually started the Center for Public Christianity over by the Opera House uh, over the Harbour Bridge. I taught uh, history at Macquarie University and Jesus and the Gospels uh, at Sydney University. And for about 10 years, I was a pastor of uh, a little church uh, called St. Andrew's Roseville. Uh, I suppose it looks like I've lived a very sheltered life all my life in that photo. Uh, but it afforded me wonderful opportunities to work out how to reach a very secularizing culture. And it all started with this woman, Mrs. Glenda Weldon, a teacher at my school when I was 16, perhaps the least shy Christian I've ever met. And she would speak about her faith in ways that would get her arrested today. And then she did what would now be illegal, certainly in your country and back in mine, she invited the class to her home just down the road from school for hamburgers, milkshakes, scones with jam and cream, and to read the Gospels of Jesus' life. I was not super interested in the Bible bit, but the hamburgers, milkshakes, that seemed pretty cool. So we turned up at her home, sometimes five or six of us, sometimes 20 of us on Friday afternoons. And she'd read the gospel and field our questions. She put up with us. We stole from her and she still invited us back. I owe so much to her. Five of the people from the one class none of whom had ever been inside a church, became Christians wow. through her. Three of us ended up in full-time ministry because of her. Humanly speaking, I owe my faith and my ministry yes, to this wonderful, unshy Christian. And I was able to catch up with her, with my family, right up until she died just six years ago. You know, despite the beautiful setting of Sydney, uh, reaching out to a post-Christian society can sometimes be daunting. And I was having a coffee with a friend, yes, still in this photo, at a cafe by the beach, a pastor friend, and we were talking about what we were doing to reach out to the people of uh, Sydney with the gospel. And I noticed this woman sitting a couple of tables away interested in our conversation. So I just kept on talking. I assumed she was a Christian, interested in the two pastors talking about reaching out to Sydney. So I chatted along until the woman got up, paid her bill, walked over to my table and in front of the full cafe looked at me and said, you want to convert the world, do you? How dare you? At which point I worked out she probably wasn't a Christian after all. <laughs> And it was one of those moments, I'm sure you've had them, when you think of the perfect comeback about three hours later. At the time, I was dumbfounded. Though I was meant to be a professional evangelist, for a moment I was shy, insecure. And the rhetoric of our secularizing world can be such that all of us, even the most devout Christian, can experience moments of shyness. Because the rhetoric of our world often tells us to shut up. Christianity is private, not public. It's harmful, not good. And so on. So, 
Where do we find the antidote to Christian shyness? Where do we find proper confidence? I think there is one teaching in Scripture, a golden thread through Old and New Testament, one principal answer to that question. And it's found in Psalm 96, and that opening passage, the first stanza, full of confidence. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. No shyness there. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Notice, will you, this is not just praise, it's outreach. It's evangelism, in fact. You know, the word translated proclaim there, proclaim his salvation. For the Hebrew nerds, it's basa, which is the word to preach the good news. It's the word that gave us the word gospel. Basar, the salvation of the Lord day by day. And it's even clearer in verse 3 because we're told that it's, it's declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. In other words, this praise is within earshot of the pagans. Now, you might find that hard to imagine. Ancient Israel praising God among the nations, until you remember that Jerusalem was the land bridge between Africa and Europe. And it was an international city. And you may remember 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41, where Solomon fully expected Gentiles to come and visit as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. The third stanza of Psalm 96 amps this up even further because the Gentiles, the pagans, are actually addressed directly in a psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, who? All families of nations. That's not Israel, that's the pagans. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, not just Israel, but all the earth. The song of praise turns out to be an invitation to the world to come and know the true God. There are so many things in this psalm that I could explore with you, but I want to focus on really just one thing. What is the rationale for this worldwide mission? What is the source of confidence? Well, we might say the fourth stanza gives the answer. Judgment. The coming judgment on the world. Maybe. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns, the world is firmly established, it cannot be moved, he will judge the peoples with equity, and so on. Judgment might be one reason we have to go and reach the world. But will you notice, judgment in this psalm is not part of the rationale for reaching out. It's actually part of the news to be proclaimed. All right. I know that sounds depressing, but actually it's glorious news that the Lord comes to judge with equity. And as we see things happen in the news, aren't you crying out for justice? But notice that's not given as the reason for reaching out. The reason is given back in the second stanza, the one I jumped over, which begins with the Hebrew conjunction key or because. Why declare his glory among the nations? Here it is. Because great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And again, key for because all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. One reason is given. 
one source of confidence, one antidote to shyness, the sheer majesty of the one true Lord, his sheer beauty, glory. That's the source of confidence. And the thing is, it's the same in the New Testament. If I were to ask you, what, what's the most famous mission passage in the New Testament, you'd all say the Great Commission, Matthew 28. But what is the single reason Jesus gives for this mission to all the world? Don't let me make it up. It's there on the screen. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which doesn't leave much authority for anyone else. Therefore, go. Do you see that? All authority belongs to Jesus the Lord. Amen. Therefore, go and make disciples and teach and baptize. Can you see that it's precisely the rationale of Psalm 96? The sheer majesty of the one Lord. That's the source of confidence. But you might say that's the apostles. What's the rationale given to average disciples? Well, the apostle Peter, speaking to the average disciple under pressure, writes these words in 1 Peter 3. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, here it is, Set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. It's clearer in the original language because verse 15 is one sentence, actually. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord, comma, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone. In other words... The reason to speak up is the sheer majesty of the Lord. Don't fear someone shouting you down in a cafe. Don't sh fear the rapid secularization that seems to be happening in America. Set apart Christ as Lord of heaven and earth and declare his glory among the nations. Because when you know that he owns the room, you'll be the best version of yourself. I don't mean he owns this room. This is a safe room. We're all friends. We're all sort of vaguely on the same page about this business. I mean every room. I mean the cafe with friends who don't believe. I mean that Thanksgiving or, you know, Christmas lunch with your grumpy, skeptical uncle. Jesus owns that room too. Every room. There might be all sorts of reasons for Christian shyness. Maybe you're just a shy personality. That's cool. I mean, some people just can't even tell a joke in public, let alone that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for their sins. Or maybe you're insecure about the intellectual foundation of Christianity, so you keep your head down. Whatever the reason, the antidote is right here. A fresh vision of the sheer beauty and majesty and glory of the one God in whose presence we all live and breathe. Three lads hopped on a bus, sorry, lad means young male, <laughs> hopped on a bus in Detroit in the 1930s and for some reason tried to pick a fight with the man at the back of the bus who didn't respond. So they turned up the heat of the insults and this guy just sat there silent, gentle, until he got to his stop and he stood up and the lads realized he was a bit bigger than they had imagined. He gave them his business card and hopped off the bus. The lads gathered around the business card and read the words, Joe Lewis, <laughs> boxer.
They had just tried to pick a fight with the man who had become heavyweight boxing champion of the world. <laughs> who obviously was in a good mood that day. <laughs> they were in the presence of greatness and they didn't know it. But I want to imagine that we were the friends of Joe Lewis on the bus that day and these lads come insulting him. Don't you reckon you could not resist saying something? Yeah. Um, excuse me, fellas. That also means young male. Excuse me, fellas. Uh, this is Joe Lewis. Of course you would. You couldn't resist saying something. Why? Maybe partly out of fear for the young boys. You know, who knows what mood he's in today? No, I reckon the main reason is his sheer greatness demands to be told. Our friends and family live and breathe in the presence of the one true Lord. And we who have glimpsed his glory will step up speak up. I'm not saying, not saying we all become evangelists. I'm saying we'll just be the best version of ourselves. The antidote to Christian shyness is a fresh vision of his majesty. You know, telling you all of this today has a special resonance. When Chaplain Wilson invited me to speak on this day. I looked at my calendar and realized actually today is the anniversary of the death of the woman who led me to Christ. I thought, wow, wow. I know what she wants me to talk about. Yeah. Don't be shy about Christ. This woman taught me that Christ owns the room. She taught me to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples, because great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are mere idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Right there is the antidote to Christian shyness. So, Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us, wherever we are in our journey, wherever we are in our level of confidence, that you would grant us as a gift a fresh vision of the majesty and beauty and holiness judgment, love and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us, Lord, the best version of ourselves for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.